Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Marco Mazia. I'm board member of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. The Marie Curie, Curie Alumni Association is an organization of researchers. Uh, we have more than 14,000 members, and it's all researchers that either are now in their Marie Curie project or have had a Marie Curie fellowship before. And we are active in many fields of science and also things related to research in general. A policy is one of the uh, fields we are active in and that's why we organize very often um, webinars about science policy. So uh, this is in our science policy webinar series and uh, our webinar uh, winning ITNs with RRI from proposal to practice is uh, something that we deem very relevant for young researchers but also like more experienced researchers who want to get in touch with uh, RRI. So I would like to just briefly uh, introduce uh, our uh, moderator Joshua Cohen who will moderate the, the entire session and I would also like to thank uh, Stephanie who's like behind the curtain she's taking care of moderating the YouTube chat so if you have any questions during the webinar just please write on the chat okay and Stephanie will take care either of answering directly or uh, relaying the, the question to, to Joshua and then we have our speakers uh, Pedro Ramos, um, Charlotte um, Weber and Anna also I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Okay, so I leave uh, the floor to you, Joshua. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll start with Stephanie. Very nice. It's for uh, everyone who's listening in now. Uh, just an introduction of your research background, uh, your interest, uh, uh, what the project was that you participated in, and what RRI means for you. Okay. Uh, I hope people can hear me now. <laughs> uh, I'll start over again. So my name is Bernard Weber. I uh, was and still am based at the University in Tromsø in Northern Norway. And I was part of the Marie Curie ITN called SAF21. So that stands for social science aspects for victories in the 21st century. And it was an interdisciplinary project to investigate the social science aspects of fisheries from multiple perspectives. I um, personally have a background in biology and moved more into, with my PhD, into interdisciplinary science. And um, I kind of stayed there. I feel like I've become much more of a broader scientist now, also through the project. And um, I think RRI for me means, um, I think my personal focus on RRI, I feel like I, I focus on certain aspects of RRI. And for me, I think a lot about open science and open access when I hear RRI. And then of course, um, as well, sort of the diversity aspects when it comes to gender, cultures, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I also think for me, RRI means that it's often sounds really great in theory, but it can be quite challenging to implement in practice. Yeah, so far from me. Thanks a lot for that. Um, and then uh, maybe moving on to, uh, to Pedro. Yes. Pedro, good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize already for my voice. I'm a little bit, uh, um, I got a little flu, but uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, uh, in terms of my uh, of the projects where I'm, where I'm still working, so it's a project that started one and a half years uh, ago, um, and this project is part of, uh, of an ITN, of course, uh, as we are here uh, uh, speaking about. Um, this is a uh, European network called InGene, and this stands for uh, improving uh, genome editing uh, efficiency. So. Uh, in, in general, we have also uh, some interdisciplinary um, uh, group of people working in this project, but the majority of them are uh, lab-based, uh, so they are doing wet lab work. Um, whereas in my case, I'm actually looking on another side of the um, of genome editing. So you might uh, heard of uh, CRISPR and this uh, new technology. Uh, let's say, kind of re revolutionized uh, a field that somehow um, was a, is, is some, 
something that people discussed a lot about in terms of ethics and, and societal aspects. But this uh, gained a much bigger focus as, uh, during the last years. So in my case, uh, what I'm doing is trying to uh, approach this uh, through some sociological um, methodology uh, where we do kind of uh, interviews, we do focus groups, we, we try to do surveys as well, uh, where we try to integrate different uh, stakeholders on the, on the project. And then we try to uh, look for these uh, features of uh, society, let's say, and how they uh, uh, back cross with, uh, with uh, genome editing and CRISPR itself. In terms of my uh, research background, uh, I come from uh, biochemistry and genetics. So let's say that I made a kind of a transdisciplinary uh, movement uh, since then. Uh, but I believe that that's also something that RRI uh, features. So actually, it's an integration of different elements, of course. But sometimes, as a whole, it means much more than the sole elements of RRI. And in that sense, I believe that for me, RRI uh, means that same transdisciplinary approach. Uh, in the sense that you can integrate multi-stakeholders, and if you do it reasonably, uh, you might end up with a, a, a best overview of, of the impact that uh, a new technology or a new scientific field might have for the society in a proper way, I must say. Thank you very much. It was uh, worded pretty eloquently, I think. Uh, okay. That's a good start. Uh, thanks to the both of you. And, and Marco? What is your take on uh, responsible research for innovation and innovation? Okay, so I am not a researcher anymore. I used to be a researcher in the fields of uh, theoretical chemistry. Uh, but now I work closely with researchers. As not only I'm a board member of the Microbial Association, I'm also executive director of uh, Initiative for Science in Europe, an umbrella organization of scientific learning societies or uh, research organizations. So I'm always in touch with science, let's say, now more on the management uh, uh, point of view. Uh, I think that it's very important to kind of ch um, make this uh, shift in the paradigm for making research. Up to now, researchers were all in their kind of ivory tower, right? And now with this push towards uh, responsible research and innovation, there is more of uh, interaction also at the project phase with what the societal values and needs are. So in my opinion, this is super important. It's important on, 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 on the one side uh, uh, for the researchers, because for them um, it's... Uh, it leads, I think, in my opinion, also to more sustainable research careers, and they, they have also like more um, not only passion for research, but also more uh, of a sense of purpose because of the connection with societal needs. Right? It's important for society, uh, broadly speaking, because uh, people are get more engaged with science and innovation, so they are more aware of what's going on. Right, so they have like also more literacy on, on, on some aspects, right? And then the, the overall system will benefit by by this. This so I think that for young scientists, like since this is uh, mostly the the topic of today's webinar, for young scientists, it's very important to to master uh, what research uh, responsible research innovation is because uh, it will be something uh, very important for the career also in future. So the earlier they start, the better. I just have like one very little last thing to say that our association is very involved with um, RRI, also involved in, in European projects uh, on that. And we are organizing now our annual conference that will be held in Zagreb at the end of March, which is about and the main topic is uh, research and democracy, but there will be, of course, within this uh, big topic, many talks about responsible research and innovation. Okay, that's that's my take on that. Perfect, thanks. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, it's interesting to see this more uh, systemic perspective also that you're taking, right? So that's, it's a, a future forward-looking perspective. Uh, and I think that's also a, a uh, my perspective on RRI, um, I myself am working uh, within the New Horizon project, 
So I'm a PhD candidate based at the University of Amsterdam, um, and together with uh, uh, 19 institutes uh, throughout uh, Europe, um, we have been tasked to uh, set up so-called social labs on responsible research and innovation um, in the whole of Horizon 2020. So in a whole uh, European funding landscape. Uh, and the idea uh, of the project, of the New Horizon project, is that it's a kind of coordination and support action um, in which we uh, help people to start discussions on uh, responsible research and innovation, but also develop specific pilot actions um, to develop it in real life, to implement it. Um, and together with uh, my colleagues, I'm uh, responsible uh, for the social lab on uh, responsible research and innovation in the Marie Curie actions. Uh, and that's also why, uh, why we are having this webinar today here, um, because this is actually one of the ideas that came out of our social lab. Uh, one of the stakeholders uh, from the uh, Marie Curie field came up with the idea to organize a webinar on um, how you can implement RI in practice, but also on how you can involve it in your proposal when you're writing a proposal for an innovative training network. And the idea uh, of this webinar, wh why we need it in the first place, is uh, because we found out through our research that uh, responsible research innovation is not always clear to everyone. Um, there could be more awareness raising um, uh, and dissemination to help people make use of it, to see where they can fit it in in their own research. Uh, to see how their own research and innovation can improve on the basis of that. Um, so that's also the goal of this, uh, this webinar today. I'm very happy to have our guests here to also really reflect on it from a more uh, personal perspective, right? To see how they uh, implemented uh, something which could, could be called responsible research and innovation in their own practice. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the plan for this webinar right now is to first give a short introduction on the Marie Curie Innovative Training Networks, uh, to, see, to clarify for everyone what we're talking about. Then on RRI, or Responsible Research Innovation, as a, a cross-cutting issue, so how it has been taken up within the European Union, uh, and specifically Horizon 2020. And then reflect with, uh, with our guests uh, today on how it has played a role in their own research. Um, so maybe just a short introduction on the uh, enough this training networks. Uh, the whole objective of this of this funding instrument is to to train a new generation of uh, what they call creative, entrepreneurial, and innovative early career researchers. Um, I'm very happy to have two of them uh, today here, and, and that these um, these people are then able to face current and future challenges and to convert the knowledge and ideas into products and services for economic and social benefits, so not just purely uh, economic benefit. Um, the innovative training networks, uh, uh, according to the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 funding instrument, are also there to really structure the research and doctoral training for uh, uh, early career researchers, and then extending that really beyond the traditional academic set, something which we'll uh, be discussing uh, shortly. And then help uh, researchers to develop skills not only in, let's say, pure research, but also uh, open science and transferable skills. And I expect that Charlotte will also um, uh, be able to uh, reflect a bit on that. Now, um, the the whole idea of this of this innovative training network is that it really enhances the, the prospects for people who are trained uh, to also be able to work beyond academia. Um, um, and uh, to develop themselves to the fullest. Now, this is just shortly this uh, innovative training uh, network set up, right? Um, but also maybe at more as a background to it, it's, uh, it's a very competitive instrument. There's a lot of people who would actually like to uh, win an innovative training network grant. Um, I think the, the latest figure is that only 8% uh, of the people actually uh, who uh, fill in uh, a proposal actually get the grant. Um, so that's, that also, I think, makes it very important to reflect on this responsible research and innovation uh, part of it. Because it is named as a cross-cutting issue uh, when you're looking uh, at the call. Now, um, if we're talking about responsible research and innovation, uh, I can uh, repeat these terms a lot, right? But I think it would be very apt now to really delve into what it actually means. What are we talking about here? What is responsible research and innovation? Um, and I think what it starts uh, with, uh, if you really want to make it very concrete, is that there's a lot of talk about societal challenges, right? We're talking about sustainability issues, we're talking about social inequality, we're talking about 
um, role of new technology in society. Um, and at the same time, you see a lot of debates on the quality of research, for example, around research integrity, uh, the reproducibility crisis, uh, and the like. Um, and there's uh, discussions, as uh, Pedro already mentioned, uh, in terms of this uh, genome editing debate about the long-term consequences of science for society um, and the possible long-term long consequences uh, uh, for other people within Europe. I think this is where responsible research and innovation comes in. Um, and it's actually based on a long-standing tradition in thinking about the relationship between science, innovation and society. Uh, for example, there have been debates about research integrity, uh, there's debates about open science, uh, bioethics uh, has been a recurrent issue. Uh, we have had debates on uh, genetically modified organisms um, uh, and technology assessment. And I think RI is actually a new label that combines all of that with a concern about the uh, competitive position uh, of Europe. Now, there have been several different definitions of what this uh, responsible research and innovation actually means. Uh, and the European Commission um, has defined it uh, as such, and I will just read it for you. Um, they have said that responsible research and innovation means that societal actors work together during the whole research and innovation process in order to better align both the process and its outcomes with the values the needs and the expectations of European society. So it's really about trying to get all types of stakeholders involved in the research and innovation process. Um, and then really trying to create research and innovation which is driven by the needs of society uh, and engages all societal actors. Well, this is, I think, the, the, the policy term here, right? Uh, the way in which the Euro European Commission has termed it, and that's also what you can find on the, the website. But I think just in one sentence, responsible research and innovation is about this relationship uh, of inclusivity between science and society, or research and innovation in society. Now, the, um, the uh, European Commission has also uh, operationalized this notion into uh, five or six so-called keys. Um, namely, first of all, public engagement. Second, uh, focus on gender equality. Third, on science education. Uh, fourth, on uh, the ethics of research. And the fifth, then, uh, role of open access. And there's always the sixth key, which is, for some, a bit vague, which is the, the governance of all of this. So what kind of uh, governance structure should we actually have if we want to have responsible research? Now I'm just going to walk through these, these five keys a bit to clarify it a bit. And I think afterwards um, we can uh, um, have a discussion with our participants here on how elements of that have been implemented in their own research. And I'd also like to remind everyone who's watching the webinar now that uh, there's room for questions, obviously, and that when we have finished discussing uh, all of this, uh, we can try to answer some questions uh, from participants. Well, the, the, the first key, or the, uh, arguably one of the uh, more important ones, is public engagement. Uh, and uh, something which was already in the definition that I just mentioned is that it's really about the engagement of all societal actors. So researchers, uh, industry, so innovators, policy makers, but also civil society. And really uh, the joint participation of, of different groups in the research and innovation process in accordance with the value of inclusiveness. So really trying to think of uh, involving all types of actors within uh, the research and innovation process. Then if you're talking about the uh, role of gender equality, we're not just uh, talking about the balance in uh, research teams, uh, uh, balance in terms of uh, equal uh, male and female participants in a research team. And we're not only talking about the balance within uh, 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 the gender balance within advisory boards or uh, let's say governing boards of, uh, of a network, but we're also really talking about the gender dimension in research content. So really thinking whether or not um, gender could actually be very relevant for the, uh, the things that you are researching and for the outcomes of what you are researching. So for example, the role of hormones uh, in certain uh, biochemical reactions, something that you can think of. That. But also if you're doing uh, societal research, if you're only interviewing uh, uh, part of the population, uh, you might have very skewed results, right? So that's also something that you can think of when we're talking about uh, responsible research and innovation. Then the third one is this uh, 
science education key, which is really about training the future generations and sharing scientific results and insights beyond the academic community, and thereby uh, contributing to a, a, a science literate society. So this could mean going out to schools, trying to talk about your research, or participating in uh, researchers' night events, um, or other uh, public events in which you actually try to warm people up to your research, um, but also um, involve their own questions uh, in it. The, the fourth one is ethics, and I think everyone, is, uh, everyone who has ever written a proposal is familiar with uh, these ethics forms that you have. Um, Right? And they, they can feel uh, a lot like a tick box. Actually, some of them are really tick boxes, which are trying to um, um, tick the right boxes so that you can get your proposal accepted. But I think ethics within responsible research innovation, uh, innovation is a bit more than that, because it's also really thinking about the longer term consequences uh, of your research, of what you are doing. Uh, trying to think about, uh, about the societal relevance and acceptability of research outcomes. Um, already thinking ahead whether or not what you are doing actually has an impact on European society. And then uh, the fifth key, open access. Um, I think there's a lot of debate now currently going on, at least on the policy level, on open science, right? Uh, and I think those debates are very much related. Uh, and this is about uh, doing open access on publications. Um, so then you can uh, think of, uh, for example, having a gold or green route, uh, different formats in which you uh, open up your publications to the wider public. Uh, but also one of the things that you can think of is open data sharing uh, and um, organizing local infrastructures uh, at your institute to make open sharing possible. That's also, uh, but there's also a role there uh, when you're thinking of open access. And finally, governance, the, the sixth uh, key, is actually making sure that the research governance structures enable uh, public engagement, enable gender equality, uh, uh, science education, and ethics. Uh, this is, this is, uh, these are the keys that uh, one can think of when trying to implement uh, responsible research and innovation in a proposal and then afterwards in practice. Um, but I, we were thinking it would also be very interesting to see how it actually really plays out in practice, in the proposal of uh, specific grantees. And therefore, uh, we're very happy to have our guests here today to reflect on that and to really see how uh, they have made, let's say, a translation between uh, more general policy language, if you will, language in terms of peace, uh, into actual research practice. Um, so therefore, I've, uh, I've asked them to prepare some uh, answers to some questions that I'll be asking. Uh, and I think one of the one of the first questions that I would then ask is how did elements of responsible research innovation, or what you could call responsible research innovation from your own perspective, how did it actually play a role within the project proposal? Um, and I don't know if uh, Charlotte wants to start or Anna. Well, I, I can start. Yeah. Uh, just very quickly, because I, I didn't introduce myself <clears throat> in the beginning. Uh, my name is Anna Olsson. I'm an animal welfare scientist uh, who got into RRI very much uh, before this was really a concept by the, uh, in age 2020, or rather before age 2020 existed, because if you work with the welfare of animals used in research, you pretty much have to start to deal with ethics and, and dialogue with society. Um, so that's my background in, in engaging with, with RRI. Uh, specifically in the context of an ITN, I am one of the, um, the supervisors of PhD students in the network IMGEN, which Pedro is uh, working with me, will tell you more details about. Uh, this um, ITN is about um, improving the technical um, aspects of CRISPR as a, gene, as a technology for, for gene editing. Um, that is, as Pedro will also explain to you, not what the project that we work with is on, but although we are obviously part of the network and connected to, to the others. Um, I was part of the, the application from the start. Uh, 
the application is coordinated by the professor Kord Brakebusch from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and the background of this application is uh, it was funded at the second attempt. Uh, I can also uh, honestly say that I don't see the difference in quality between our application that was funded at the second attempt and another one that I've been involved uh, in, which has had three unsuccessful attempts. Uh, and I'm saying that because it's a little, I feel it's a little pretentious of me to to claim that I have any answer to how this this improved the success of the uh, the proposal. My personal opinion is that uh, the ITNs are so competitive um, that really, uh, one, you cannot you cannot miss and you cannot fail on anything. Two, you have to have something which is extra. Uh, and that has to be something that is extra that appeals to the people who evaluate your proposal, and this you won't know. So it's 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 a gamble in in, in this sense. Having said that, uh, and uh, well, well, having said that, uh, for um, a proposal on gene editing, which is something that raises enormous uh, controversy and enormous discussion, things like designer babies and the desirability of, of messing, quote unquote, with the genome, uh, as well as the, the, the skepticism and resistance that is patterned, especially in some European countries, against GM in, in food. Um, for a proposal like that, I think it would have been an absolute uh, loser if it would not have included a package on our uh, so I think in this case, uh, I think that was really the, uh, a, a game changer. We could still not have won the, the, the funding for other reasons, um, but that's that's my perspective on that. So essentially, what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that um, you you are not certain whether or not it has improved the quality of the proposal, but you're very certain that without it, uh, you would have. A problem in getting the funding because it's such a highly uh, debated topic, highly contentious. Yes, uh, but uh, what I'm saying, uh, I'm rather saying that I'm not sure for, for each ITN, for some ITNs, this having a, an RRI component is, is certainly something that adds a lot to, to it. I guess for other topics, there are other aspects that are perhaps more important to, to invest in. Uh, the one that Imgen is, is working on is clearly one which is basic research. So uh, the industry collaborations, patents, etc., is not really something that we could uh, use for added value for, for this. And it certainly, since it is a controversial topic, yes, I think uh, I think here it would really be impossible to go forward with without an all right. Mm -hmm. Great. And. Um, um... Could you maybe share a bit more on how it was integrated to the proposal under, let's say, excellence or impact or implementation? Because you have different parts of the proposal, right? Than uh, well, yes, specifically in, in this this um, project, there is a, there is not a work package as such on RRI, but there are eight uh, fellowships. Mm -hmm. uh, seven of which do wet lab research, and the eighth, uh, this is actually number eight, is a, a work, is, is a project that is uh, really completely on RRI. It even has RRI in, in the title. So I think I think we have, in, in that sense, I mean, we have sort of maximum integration of RRI. It's really part of the research. It's not like a, an added. Uh, Padding to 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 otherwise technical research, but there is a real research focus on RRI within the context, uh, within the main res uh, research topic of the the ITM. All right, thanks. Um, maybe first, uh, also asking uh, Charlotte a bit. Yeah. you would like a bit on how elements of RRI or what you could, would call RRI played a role within the project proposal? Uh, of the project in which you were uh, integrated? Yes, so um, I think it's really interesting to hear these different perspectives because our project was 
quite the opposite. So we didn't really have any lab work or genetics involved at all. It was a lot of focus on simulations and forecasting. We had computer science in and theoretical work and social science investigations. Um, so it was quite different, I guess, from what we just heard. And I think the role it played in the project proposal, so obviously I didn't write it, right? I was a, a PhD as part of this project. And the project was written in 2013 already for the first time and then written it or submitted again in 2014. So that was exactly the shift from framework program seven to Horizon 2020 before sort of RI was made such an explicit component of these proposals. But I think we integrated it in all aspects of the proposal. So it was in excellence uh, where we really tried to highlight how we would investigate aspects of RI within the scientific work. For example, we would explicitly look into diversity and gender roles in fisheries in our context. Um, we would also see, do the, the tools and theories we develop for one country actually apply in another one? Um, so, and we would use the network and the mobility that is provided through such a project to, you know, sort of support these types of research questions that would investigate um, something on gender and culture. Um, at the same time, I think... Uh, we had to also be really creative. I think that was maybe one of the most important things in such a project because you don't have these very clear ethical concerns necessarily. So we have to be a little bit creative on how we implement uh, these aspects. And I think that was a real strength in our proposal that we made ethics really explicit, but um, on several dimensions. So we would say there would be one training but also practicing ethical science and then also creating arenas for discussion. Um, and we would take these things in the very beginning of the project so that you would already have awareness um, when you would start your research. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of focus on impact, I think. How could we use our eye for our impact? And I think thinking about ITNs and what they're made for, I, I like to think of an ITN, haven't completed one. Uh, I completed my ITN last year. So I think the, the real end product of an ITN is the researcher that comes out of it. Because it's not only about the excellent science, it's really about creating this PhD that comes out of this as a very well-trained scientist uh, that has much more competencies than just uh, research skills. And so we, we looked a lot into RI in the implementation and impact to really train the PhDs on RI issues, but also make sure that the, the ESRs, the, the researchers, would get involved into different initiatives where you would not only learn, but you could also contribute to issues on RI. For example, explicitly now, like join certain working groups um, in organizations, like I was part of Eurodoc, which is a European PhD organization, umbrella organization, and they work actively with open science. So that was one way to increase the impact of the project and of the researchers, because this is likely something you can learn from, contribute to, and that may live on after the project end. So there was a lot of focus on getting involved into topics and finding ways to, to practice RI, really and to, to support the researchers in building their personal capacity as well when it comes to these RI questions. Good. Thank you. Uh, and could you reflect a bit on that, uh, that Eurodoc uh, placement that you're talking about? Because I know that you've been involved with uh, transferable skills, right? How it was related to your project? So this was sort of really written in the project the proposal that they would, you know, that they were aware of these organizations and that they would try to get uh, us ESRs involved. Uh, and so I did. Uh, and I just simply joined certain working groups uh, that I found interesting and related somewhat to, to the project, what we would also get training in. So that was open science. But we also had a big focus, of course, on transferable skills training in general and the importance of skills and competencies in further career development. 
So I got involved in all these working groups and that was a really cool way to use what we would learn internally in the project and kind of bring it back to a European level because we got a lot of extensive training in transferable skills. So I could take my lessons learned from the project and sort of pass them on. So it felt like I would have a bigger impact with this. Um, at the same time, I could bring back what I would learn on a European level and share experiences with others all over Europe. Because even though you have a network, we were 10 ESRs in my project, you have nine other people to talk to, but it's of course great if you have 50 other people that come from every single European country that you can actually get into exchange and you expand your network at the same time. And um, it's then easier to get involved into higher level initiatives. For example, in terms of open science, I was involved all of a sudden in providing feedback towards Plan S. So that felt really great. And there was all came sort of through, there was like the ripple effect of uh, the project that it said originally, we'll take RI seriously. We make sure our people get involved in these different groups and work on these topics actively, that there will be an exchange. Thanks. And, and could you maybe just uh, clarify uh, for those attending the webinar also, what kind of transferable skills did you uh, learn and how did you process, transfer them if you will, to others? Yeah, uh, that's of course always the big question, right? Like what are transferable skills and so on. But um, I think one thing of course you learn is we had the basic training in, for example, cultural dimensions, communication, visualization skills, um, team working, leadership skills, um, sort of, you know, there's a whole list of them that we went through sort of more like formal training, also entrepreneurship, um, through workshops and courses, how can you set up your own company and these kinds of things. But I also think that we learned a lot of transferable skills more implicitly, just being part of the project, like through organizing your own mobility, through managing your own project, having access to your budget that you need to manage, organize, uh, divide, see how far you get with what, make decisions. Um, we learned a lot through this as well. So I think ITNs just teach you so much more than just what's the formal training. It's, you, you know, you learn how to network, you learn how to communicate across cultures, countries, you're probably based in a different country than your home country. Um, yeah, just so much more than just uh, research skills, really. Thanks. And um, uh, Pedro, maybe you would like to also reflect on uh, what um, RI did to you, your research. How has it affected your uh, research positively? Yes. What we research about, maybe, also, right? Yes. I think, I think in my case, I will divide uh, my, my intervention in, in two uh, main things. One is mostly uh, concerning on the project, and I'll just, I have just very few slides to show. Uh, so I hope I can share my screen with you all. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is exactly uh, the, the project that we were uh, speaking about. So the gene, uh, improving genome editing efficiency. Uh, as you might also uh, see, we have uh, a home page where we have uh, an, an update of, of different things that we, we actually uh, do on the page. One is, uh, for example, we have a paper of the month. So we actually, all of uh, our different fellows write uh, a paper each month, or at least not, not a paper, but we write a, a summary of a, a given paper that is about genome editing and we publish it, so in a way to try to improve also the, the reachable uh, public uh, outside, not just the scientific one. Uh, and as, as you can also see, we have also Facebook and Twitter, so we try to make some updates uh, in there, so we are uh, somehow active on the social media. And also to put a face on, on, on people, uh, these are the eight ESRs uh, from, from the project, which uh, where I also uh, represent one of, one of them, of course. And as you might look, if you uh, read it uh, very shortly, all of them, as I said, are in a wet lab uh, based uh, scenario. In my case, uh, I am actually uh, concerned with uh, facilitating genome editing as RRI. So this is exactly uh, the 
the title of my project. And what I can say when Imgene uh, uh, stands as well as RI is exactly on the approach that we have with big multi-stakeholders. So we have different stakeholder perspectives, and those are the ones that we aim for. So we, when we use these sociological methods, whether they are interviews, focus groups, or, or surveys, we try to look for the status of a given technology, in this case it's uh, CRISPR, uh, and its potential. So we try to look for the drawbacks and the potential of a given technology. And of course, the main goal of this uh, is to anticipate consequences on science and technology revolution. So in our case, it's very important to improve the, the way that we uh, see uh, RRI in the sense that CRISPR is a revolutionary uh, technology. And this is inserted in something that I don't know if uh, everybody uh, knows about it, which is called science, technology and society, or it can also be called science, technology, uh, uh, um, society studies, STS. Uh, and so STS is also a representation of RRI in uh, in this sense, uh, in the case of of, of, um, of, of the, the investigation that we do. So in terms of RI, I think it's also uh, pretty clear, and I'll stop sharing the, the screen now, uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, some of the main axes of the, of the RI, we actually, of the elements, we try to integrate them. Whether it's public engagement, where we look for different stakeholders and we gather them, and we do a kind of a co-creation with them because we interview them, we actually uh, um, do a kind of a, a, an assessment to their opinion, their arguments, their points of view, of course. Uh, and then we also have the ethics axis as one of the main uh, on the project itself. Uh, of course, when it comes to the gender, and I, I heard a lot, so they, they had a, a big focus on that. In our case, we don't have a much, so much focus on that because genome editing is something very transversal and it really doesn't depend on the gender by itself. Uh, but I believe that um, even though we have some, some, uh, some other axes that we actually have within this project, one of them is actually the science education. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, correlated with public engagement. And the idea of having this uh, uh, and how is it is inserted in our project is, for example, we have a patient organization in our uh, network. So that's very important because we have another perspective of a different group of stakeholders, and we have actually a, a focus on that scientific education for that kind of, of public and how their input is uh, important for, for us. Mm -hmm. um, I might also say that um, be, beside all the project that we have and the different sociological methods that we apply, um, I think this RI and, um, and the project where, where I'm inserted in uh, opens up a different bunch of, of, of stuff uh, in the sense that we have during our uh, ITM, we have summer schools and we have winter meetings. And during this time, where we gather with the different ESRs, uh, we actually have different training on some transferable skills. So, uh, for example, in our case, one thing that, uh, that came up at some point was the introduction, the introduction of a video game. So how does a video game can be useful um, for uh, something that is uh, about genome editing, and how, what can we take on as uh, for for as a, an impact, not just to the to the to the scientific uh, people, uh, uh, DSRs and the supervisors, but also with the patient organization, and lately, if we can do it for the general public. So, in a way, we have different scenarios that we actually try together in this. Uh, in this kind of network, and I believe that's uh, of utmost uh, importance, actually. Thanks, thanks a lot. And I think I think it's uh, it's interesting uh, to see uh, similarities. But do you yourself already see some similarities between your own projects then? Because indeed you're like a, a maybe complete opposite uh, content-wise, if you will, but still. 
what, uh, what kind of similarities do you see here? Well, I, I believe that one of them, and I guess that's I don't know. I don't know if it's the one that fits the most with the R right principles, also how how we want to classify it. But I guess that when you have public engagement, and this public engagement might mean the, the general public or public or other uh, stakeholders from different uh, parts of, 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 of the society. Once they are involved somehow, you are already a little bit more closer to what our right is. So in that sense, I believe that the projects that have these, these, these uh, interrelation within this axis, I guess that's one of the things that makes it closer. Uh, maybe the ethics part as well, but that one might be a little bit more uh, tricky. For example, these two projects is very clear of the of the ethics, and the other is uh, it's some pretty hard and stupid. Uh, it can be there as well. It depends on how you perhaps it or you. It was, uh, so I, I, I think it's really Pedro said, but uh, I think in general I, the similarity is just I think that both projects demonstrate really that RI is an important aspect and and really made that more explicit. I think maybe Pedro's project more than others because or than ours in particular because it made it so so clear that there was one project on its own just on RI. Whereas for us, it was really much more sprinkled, you know, through everybody's work in one way or the other. Uh, and then, of course, but I see the similarity that we also had these joint trainings, like you call it uh, summer schools and winter meetings, I think. And we had, uh, we I don't even remember, I think, yeah, we had training camps. That's what it was called. So, you know, to have these sort of explicit get togethers where you where you share your experiences on these topics. I think is would be maybe the most obvious similarity for me where you get together as a group because these are also very special experiences that you because you are placed everywhere you know and distributed all over Europe and then you come together and you, you learn different things along the way throughout your research throughout different training you take outside the network even and then you come and bring it all back in uh, especially as you know when people have been involved in different initiatives like for example I was involved uh, in the European organization and then other people were involved in their local organizations or with their were joined some working groups with their local libraries on open access for example so many different experiences that you then bring together during these meetings so I, that was a very valuable for us and I guess it must have been similar for, for Pedro and, and his project to really get that open communication and exchange. Yeah, and, and when, when I'm, uh, because I'm, I think I'm uh, on the same path here when I'm thinking of the similarities myself, is that the, these ITNs are obviously set to train the next generation of promising researchers, right? Uh, and then, then do it interdisciplinarily, uh, uh, intersectorally, but also transdisciplinary, maybe. So really involving this public engagement perspective. Um, and because there's this room for uh, transferable or soft skills training, I think what, what people who are interested in integrating RI in uh, IBM can do is really think of uh, integrating training programs on responsible research innovation or elements thereof, right? So really getting researchers to, uh, early career researchers to practice with uh, two-way public engagement, uh, to really try to think of this gender gen dimension wherever relevant in their research, uh, to practice with science education, uh, uh, and to really train them to become very uh, uh, integer, integer researchers, or really training them on research integrity also, and the procedures that are involved there. Um, and finally, I think something like open data management, um, especially within the uh, debate on open science is something that uh, might be relevant for people to involve their thinking of RI. Uh, and last but not least, thinking of the long-term ethical implications of what you're doing. Uh, and societal implications. And I think both your projects show how you how you can do that uh, in practice. Um, now I'm also looking at some of the, the questions that we're uh, we're getting in here. Um, 
one of the, the first questions that I've received uh, is uh, how to implement ethics in the proposal. Uh, and obviously what I said, there's this uh, specific ethics uh, paragraph uh, that is asked in the proposal. I don't know if this is something that you are comfortable with uh, answering, or Anna maybe, since you're an expert on ethics. Probably comment on that uh, more from the, the experience that I have on uh, participating in, in ethics review panels on Horizon 2020. Uh, so just to to um, basically describe how ethics is dealt with in proposals for H2020 funding uh, is different from what most national funding is is, is handled. So um, after a decision is after the science part has been evaluated and the decision has been made to recommend a project for funding, uh, the ethics is is looked at um, and it's first done by the the uh, uh, um, the um, employees of the H2020, so the uh, European Research Council executive agency has a department for, for ethics uh, and they do a rapid screening so that they can screen out proposals that are basic research on physics which have no, no uh, ethics uh, implications because the ethics implications have based mainly to do with uh, human and animal subjects and potential uh, effects on the environment and misuse or dual use of them. Uh, the, the research. Uh, and then those that are remaining, they go for an expert evaluation, those that seem to have something of ethical issues uh, in it. Uh, and that means that people like, like me, uh, a number of scientists, lawyers, ethicists, uh, with some knowledge of ethics of science, depending on the topic, uh, will look at what you have written in your, your ethics uh, self-assessment and uh, either say it's okay or more, uh, more commonly ask additional questions or additional clarifications. And, and basically what happens is the better you have described your ethical uh, issues and how you will deal with them in your application, the faster your successful application will go through the, the system. Uh, if you have left this until the last minute and basically not written anything, which happens, it means that it doesn't mean that you won't get funding because uh, that is not going to kick you out, but it means that you will have to do all the work after afterwards, and it takes longer before you get funding. Uh, it is. Uh, I, I think everyone should actually do this themselves as a starting point or or finishing it. It themselves, but I would also my recommendation also is because you need to get familiar with you need to know what are the ethical issues of your proposal. Uh, but unless you're really an expert on the ethics issues of your proposal, I also recommend uh, that you consult with the people in your institution uh, who handle this the, the ethical issues. Uh, they are most likely experienced with doing this for, for age 2020 and they will uh, they will know how to help you with how to identify the significant issues in your project and uh, how to describe them so i would i can give this advice to people in my organization if it is about research with animals if it is about research with humans and human material which is the case of the the, the, the project that i coordinate myself in age 2020 now I'm actually not really, uh, well, I really struggled a little bit to, to get this, this handled with. So this is something I, I would have benefited from asking someone else for help with. Yeah, Can sure. I follow up on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, because actually in our project, uh, it was maybe implemented a little differently. Of course, we had a clear section on these ethical issues, like typical treatment of uh, data you collect that may be sensitive and things like that. But I think we also really included ethical considerations into the training of the ESRs. So in our project, ethics were a big part sort of in the theory of the work of every ESR. So we would ensure that the ESR would have considered the ethics of their own low research projects. 
Uh, and for that purpose, we implemented a training course in ethics and philosophy of science, also very early in the beginning of the project. That was a very extensive two-week course um, where we would do nothing but learn and discuss um, ethical considerations of science. And that was very interesting. And it kind of resulted, we all had to write essays afterwards. So we really had to also practice on what we had learned. And many of us used this to then put it as a chapter into their thesis. So I had already, you know, sort of four months into my PhD, I had a 15 page uh, work on the ethical aspects of my research and the implications thereof. And it was really nice because I could come back and revisit that chapter and build on it as my research developed. And I used it in my thesis. And it actually, I think it greatly improved the quality of both my research and my thesis. And it wasn't the classical, you know, I did a lot of theoretical work and I did a lot of investigation of interdisciplinarity. And I discussed, you know, it's kind of on the edge between ethics and philosophy of science, but I would then discuss more about what is a discipline, can this research I'm doing become a discipline, and um, what is interdisciplinarity and value of science, and how do we, you know, different modes of scientific research and so on. So this is how we integrated it into our project as well, really to make it very explicit in the individual um, species, really. So, so then what you're saying is what people, when they're writing a proposal, could also consider as actually having trainings on these types of skills in the proposal already written. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially uh, because it's um, considered a, a very important skill these days. So I would almost recommend it. If you talk to many people, they say they, they think that a lot of ESRs lack ethical training that people are unaware and it's really something that where we should work on some capacity building. So I think having this in the, in a proposal, training ESRs and ethics and making it an explicit component can really strengthen it. Um, another question that we're getting also is uh, science education, is this not for uh, early stage researchers too? I think, well, yeah. Um, Maybe I'm the most apt to answer this, um, but I don't know about you, but I think, sh sure, the, the whole goal of the ITN is to train early stage researchers to become the uh, research leaders of the future, maybe. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the extras here, which you could integrate in your proposal if you're thinking of science education, is really also trying to educate all different parts of the public uh, on what you have been doing. Um, so really trying to disseminate your, uh, um, your findings and trying to educate uh, and to increase the scientific literacy of communities in which uh, uh, your research institutes are situated. Uh, and I'd also like to just use this question to elaborate on that science education and public engagement themselves are also different things maybe, right? Because what you can do obviously is disseminate your results and try to increase the knowledge uh, and capacities of people in the community uh, on the basis of what you have been researching, trying to maybe warm them, warm them up also for a scientific career. Um, but at the same time, if you're doing uh, public engagement, this also means it's dialogical. It's trying to get a two-way communication going with the public and actually trying, also trying to integrate some of their uh, viewpoints and concerns. I think that's something that Pedro uh, has been explaining in his, uh, in his own uh, research. So I'd just like to flag that, uh, that point here. Uh, and another question which may be uh, interesting for you to answer is, so how is this whole RRI thing different from common sense? Why do we need to think of it in terms of responsible research and innovation? I think it's a great question. Anyone would like to respond to that? Well, <laughs> common sense is the least common sense that exists, I, I think. I think it's, I think you put yourself, you place your, you make yourself very vulnerable if you will rely on common sense to deal with. Challenging issues in the interaction 
And could, could you elaborate a bit on that? What do you mean with that common sense is the least common sense? Because I don't think we have common sense. I mean, what some might think that our eyes is common sense thing is common sense is different from what someone else. If everyone thought that the issues that are in my eye, eye were common sense, uh, if that was the common sense of everyone, then we wouldn't need RI. But I would argue that that mm -hmm. it isn't. That people have different, uh, very different uh, uh, ideas of, of this. And, and I'll uh, take an observation activities that came out of, of New Horizon, the one that I'm involved in, um, uh, which when we brought members of the public together to uh, hear their view of how they would like to interact with science of, of citizens of Lisbon in, in 2019 felt that science was something very alien, very distant, something they had no, uh, they were so far from that they didn't really even know what kind of questions to, to ask. Um, and what does that tell you, this, this particular example? Uh, so I, I think that tells us that it's, it takes it takes more to have a dialogue with uh, the non-scientific members of society. And you see, I make an effort to uh, not to talk about this as being science and society as two different groups, because obviously we are all citizens and we're all part of society. Uh, but those of us in society who are not scientists, many of them, uh, do you not feel that science uh, is is very close to them, and and it, therefore it takes more from us as members of the scientific community to enter into that dialogue than still, oh, here I am, this is what I'm doing. Uh, also, because the way that we tend to speak about what we are doing is the way we speak with our science colleagues, and that's not understandable to someone who is not a scientist. This is, in fact, often not even understandable to someone who is a scientist from a different field. Yeah, and I think it's, it's also important to note that there, there have been lots of developments already uh, in terms of um, creating different formats uh, for interaction between scientists and uh, non-science affiliated citizens, right? There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, knowledge already also on, uh, let's say, the role of the gender dimension within research, uh, of research integrity, but also long-term ethical implications of research. There's, there's tons of resources, and there's also, uh, uh, I collected some of these resources, uh, and you can also find them yourself on the website, which is called rri-tools.eu. There's a lot of resources which people can then actually use to uh, try to uh, integrate in their proposal and I think um, I think what is uh, what is important to note here indeed is that uh, a lot of this is happening already right in the project that we just have been described there's a lot of uh, good cases out already but it's really good to try to move away from the thought that everything uh, which we have been discussing this morning is common sense already and I think that's also interesting when you're writing a proposal that if you want to stand out and if you want to do something different from uh, uh, maybe others that are writing proposals, it might then be interesting to integrate these elements of RI in your proposal and to really do something different as compared to other people who are writing uh, similar proposals. Now, um, I think one of the uh, one of the general other tips that we might uh, give here is that since there's uh, so much room for inter uh, multidisciplinarity um, and intersectoral exchange within IT and so it's actually valued, uh, something which uh, you, uh, someone who's writing a proposal might also think of is the integration of civil society organizations and other uh, non-academic uh, public representative organizations. And what I just heard from your uh, story, Pedro, is that um, you also have integrated a patient organization, right? That's correct. Yeah. So we have um, we have um, a patient organization uh, in the UK named uh, um, Genetic Alliance, and they they actually uh, have um, a lot of different uh, events promoted by themselves. 
and they actually are interested part on this and they also have uh, the feedback that we provide when we uh, talk about the different research that we conduct uh, ourselves um, and then they um, are able to give them to give their input as well so for example one of the cases where they are actually more important for us uh, in the sense that we are ESRs and people that are uh, in the scientific community and sometimes might be a little bit uh, far away from the general public is exactly on the purpose of scientific education. So how, how to speak with, with the public in lay terms, in, in terms that they understand fully what we talk about. Saying that, uh, saying gene editing, for example, is completely different from saying genome editing. It's just a very different three words, uh, three, um, three letters that makes the total difference when we are talking uh, with different public. So, in this sense, they are valuable input for us, and I believe we are also for them, because the different research that we do, uh, and of course, this is also spread in the type of cells that we use, the type of applications, uh, uh, although they are mostly for human, um, for human setups, of course, but I think they also learn with us, and we learn with them. And I think that's also something that maybe RRI uh, might not have it written, right? The different, how, how, but it has the co-creation part. So I think this is a, a fine line of co-creation that we have uh, when you integrate a, a stakeholder like this one. So I believe that that is also very, uh, something that is very important, uh, whether you have a, an ITN or a project proposal for, a, for, for this, it might be. Uh, in our case, I believe it is. Thanks. Uh, is that something you recognize, Charlotte, or you feel very different about? Or No, no, absolutely. I fully support everything uh, Pedro said, 100%. Um, I think we had similar aspects in our proposal as well, that we integrated sort of people where we felt like, and as partners and organizations, where we felt this could really bring in other parts of society outside of just the scientific institutions. And uh, we had both, we had companies, so really people who would work with industry, um, because we were in the fisheries uh, context, so it was really important for us to have companies involved that know fisheries, right, that know the fishers and so on. At the same time, we also wanted to have sort of bodies involved where we felt that we could use our knowledge for, for in particular um, science education. So we had a, a museum or sort of aquarium, actually two of these where we could uh, go in and say, well, how could we, you know, translate what we have learned in our research into something that we can actually display in a, in a museum, in an aquarium. Uh, so that was very valuable for us. And they were definitely stakeholders where they said, hey, we would love to take this, you know, when we bring in kids groups and this would be really valuable for us to use. And they were really good in helping us learning how to translate our knowledge and how to make it more relevant and to have more of a societal impact, really. Because these are often the people who bring you more down to earth, almost, I'd like to say. Like you have all these scientific ideas and then somebody comes along and says, well, actually, I work on a goal every day. What I need is such and such and you're like oh wow i haven't even thought about this right so really bringing in the stakeholders to both influence your science but also to give back so the the, the real idea like pedro also mentioned was the co-creation um to really do something for each other and and make it together make it better yeah i think that's a that's a perfect uh, um way to de um, describe i think uh, the, the added value also right uh, the added value for you as a researcher but also the added value for the community groups who might be helping the research and i think also um i think the yeah quite possibly a lot of the, the future of how science will develop if you're looking at the current open science debate um, and, and the discussions on responsibility that are taking place at the higher policy levels right now uh, for example as related to artificial intelligence there is this 
yeah, a wave of people who are really interested in trying to uh, do research and innovation in uh, maybe a different way as you would do it 20 years ago, I think. So that's, uh, and I think uh, your stories both are exemplars of how you could uh, go about that. Um, so I'd really like to uh, thank you a lot for that. And I've also maybe as a, um, a more uh, concrete advice finally for people who are interested in integrating what we have just been discussing in their own proposals is that uh, obviously you have these uh, specific evaluation criteria for the for the uh, innovative training network calls like you have the uh, excellence criterion you have the impact criterion and the implementation uh, criterion and i think that the gender dimension is something that uh, which is explicitly mentioned uh, under the excellence criteria so I'll always try to reflect on whether or not uh, gender really uh, might play a role in your research process uh, or uh, in the uh, validity of the outcomes of the process. Uh, science, education and public engagement, I think we have just been describing ways in which you could do that um, in practice. Um, but uh, I think that's also something which is asked for under the impact criterion for the uh, innovative training network. So that's something where people might consider um, your uh, success stories, uh, but also others, and uh, learn from that and see how uh, they can integrate it in their own proposal. Uh, and open access is another thing which is uh, very relevant, I think, under impact. And finally, just noting again that ethics really can be something which goes beyond ticking the boxes, uh, as something which really structures your whole research. Uh, for example, as Pedro described, he is actually an early stage researcher who takes care of the responsible research innovation part of the IMG project. So it, what you could do is develop uh, a specific uh, uh, task or role within a project for someone who takes care of it. Uh, and Charlotte has been describing that she actually, they actually had a two-week training already at the start of the project in which people were really reflecting on how ethics can play a role in their research. And that it actually has influenced her thesis uh, and research uh, subsequently. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground here today. Uh, and. Uh, all thanks to you, I think, also, and thanks to the support of uh, Marco and Stephanie. I don't know if you have a, a final thought that you would like uh, to share with the participants, or anything which you would like to share still. I would like to say that RRI is fun. It, it, it is a very interesting challenge. Um, obviously, some of us or more um, interested, more motivated to reach out, to communicate in, in general. Um, but for, for anyone, it is, uh, I think it's a useful challenge to, to think about your research in a different way than what you do uh, within a more closed uh, scientific context where you focus on what research, your, research questions you have, uh, what methods you're using to, to address them and, and share your, your results with the community of people that work with similar topics. Great. So I can also give my, uh, uh, I fully agree with Anna, not just the, the fun part, but also the, the, the how insightful it is for um, an early stage uh, uh, researcher, because the way that our career uh, progresses it's very shaped by the different things that we learn uh, during um, these ITMs that we do. One of them, uh, and I can actually uh, say, and that's the reason why I'm also here, was actually uh, learning from the Your Horizon uh, one. So I believe that these social labs, the ones that you are developing, I couldn't have met them if it wasn't for RRI and for the project where I'm inserted. And sometimes this kind of stuff opens up your perspectives and, they, and opens up the possibility to meet other people that are sometimes representing other um, frames of the, of the society involved in different uh, projects as well. And it's actually the fact that you can uh, sometimes uh, just chat with them or, or be in events with them that this will actually improve as well your own uh, career, your own projects, might be might be also one of the things that makes it fun uh, and makes it uh, successful, uh, perhaps. Okay. Carol? 
Yes. Okay. Maybe um, some final tips from my side. Uh, if you want to include RI in your proposal, and I think one is to be also aware of the challenges of RI, that it's not always easy in practice. It always sounds really great in theory, but um, we realized when running the project, and I can say this now because we have finished the project since last year, um, there's many differences in attitudes and awareness towards RI across um, all levels in uh, research. And so what we were almost missing were somewhat clear rules at times and or guidelines to guide us through RI challenges in practice that we had not thought of before. Um, and one was, for example, the attitudes and the support of the supervisors of the ERSRs. Like we, we noticed sometimes there was a lot of training involved on sort of like a bottom-up approach. But then if you don't have the support of the supervisors to implement it in the thesis, after all, uh, it can get very difficult. So one suggestion I would have if I would do something like this again would to include something on train the trainers. Um, Really, it, it would definitely contribute to increased impact and capacity building, I would say, especially on the more recent issues like open science. A lot of the supervisors don't always have time, so if you already include that in the project, it would be great that they also learn more and can be better advisors in a sense. And I also think that there is sometimes, yeah, like I said, the lack of, of rules or guidelines how to navigate certain issues. We came across that a lot when it comes to open access and publishing, like who should pay when. Um, very practical uh, things that ended up in huge discussions because nobody knew. Um, and it was hard to, to figure your way out through the project. So it, you spend a lot of time and energy on um, like, should there be a limit to how much APC we're actually willing to pay? Um, you know, so I even think you could increase your impact if you were to develop some of these rules for RI issues and the challenges that may come with it in the implementation of it and when conducting RI. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, it's very good to be aware indeed um, of the challenges involved uh, and also. Um, something which I noticed myself, obviously, through the research in the New Horizon project, that it's, um, it's something which is always in development. Um, but I think um, what might help people who are then still interested in implementing it uh, and not sure how to do it, uh, I will share some slides uh, to, the one, to the people who have signed up to this webinar, uh, in which I include some very practical resources uh, which, uh, which you can use if you're thinking about public engagement or research integrity or open access. Uh, and I'll just put it, uh, I'll, I'll share it with everyone so that they can take a quick look for themselves. Uh, it's a bit too late for Charlotte, unfortunately, to take a look at it now since her project is finished, <laughs> but maybe for the others it might be an uh, inspiration. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, uh, for attending uh, the webinar today. Uh, and a special thanks uh, to the participants who have. Uh, talked a bit about their projects uh, and about what they have been experiencing uh, in practice. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and I hope that it was informative for everyone and it was fun for the participants to be a part of this. Uh, and um, maybe we'll be in touch in the future on this topic again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.